Thank you to NordPass for sponsoring this video. Сделайте заказ. Пора вторгаться в Украину. Хорошо, это так, мальчики. Время начинать атаку. Ждать, что это такое? Ukraine, a country most of us didn't even think about until 2022, when Russia decided to showcase its military might. And even if we did think of it, usually what would come to mind was exploding nuclear generators, vodka, and mail order brides. Where's the hotties? And now, in addition to that, war. Hello, Kishida. It's Zelensky. We need a new Evangelion 01. Zero two and the pie was for them. Arigato. Glory to Japan. But that's not all there is to this nation. With a country being the largest one in Europe, its history is not far behind. With that said, come with me on a journey to where the story of this beautiful country all began. Not here! Not here! Ah, the history of Ukraine dates back to ancient times. Evidence of the first human settlements comes first to the Paleolithic period, about 1 million years ago. Yet the first modern day humans didn't appear there until 32,000 BC. Several prehistoric cultures reside in the area up until the Iron Age, where with the arrival of the Dacians and nomads like the Scythians and Sarmatians established powerful empires in the region. The Scythian Empire, for example, at its height, controlled the majority of Ukraine, half of the North Caucasus, and a good chunk of Romania and Bulgaria. In the 3rd century, the Goths joined the party until they were inevitably kicked out by the Huns in their campaign of scourging half of Europe and forcing half the continent to eat nothing but goulash for the next 70 years. After the Huns collapsed, similarly to any modern African state, modern day Ukraine started to become overrun by new Slavic settlers. Throughout the 5th and 6th centuries, migrations from modern-day Poland and Ukraine took off, and Slavic settlers went on to establish new Slavic states north, west, south, and east of Ukraine, bringing with them stylish Adidas tracksuits, shitty techno, and the habit of putting mayo in every salad imaginable. Soon after the Roman Empire collapsed and the time period known as the Medieval Ages took over, the territory of modern-day Ukraine was subject to constant turbulent migrations by various people groups. As the Slavs settled the area, so did more semi-nomadic horsemen, such as the Bulgars and Khazars, who also established their own kingdoms, engulfing most of Ukraine's steppe. Upon their establishment, many trade routes going across Europe were also created, which brought in even more peoples to Ukraine, such as the Jews and Vikings. With the arrival of the Vikings, one of the most important ancient civilizations in Ukraine was born, the Kievan Rus, which emerged in the 9th century. A lot of what is known about the Kievan Rus is debated by scholars and internationalists alike, and I'm sure that what I already mentioned so far triggered someone to write down a 10-page essay in the comments about how I'm wrong. I'm looking at you, Z Dravko. Kirtina, kirtina, ooh, kirtina, kirtina, ooh. Nevertheless, it is sort of accepted that with the arrival of the Vikings, most of them became assimilated by the local Slavs. The state officially came to be under Viking Prince Oleg, as he marched his armies across modern day Russia and Belarus, before reaching Kyiv, where he defeated its then Norse rulers and proclaimed himself the Prince of Kyiv and established it as the capital of the Kievan Rus. Over the next couple of centuries, Kyiv prospered as one of the wealthiest trade centers of Europe, as more traders across Europe and Asia came to its doorstep. Most notable products traded across its lands were fur, beeswax, honey, and slaves, a predecessor to Ukrainian mail order brides. As trade increased, luxury goods such as jewelry and religious wear started to be traded as well. Do 
alongside the city's expanding trade, the Kievan Rus also expanded as it incorporated its nearby lands into its empire. During this rapid period of expansion, the Kievan Rus also started to play a crucial role in the spread of Christianity in Eastern Europe, with the introduction of Orthodox Christianity in the 10th century. According to legend, the then prince Vladimir the Great, before accepting Christianity as his religion, sent out several advisors across the land to find him a new faith. He rejected Islam because of their ban on drinking and Judaism because the Jewish God allowed his people to take a big fat owl. With Yet, he found the Hagia Sophia and the Orthodox liturgy so beautiful that he accepted Orthodoxy as his true faith. But, in reality, he most likely got baptized due to wanting closer ties with Byzantium like any other 14-year-old monarchist from the Midwest. In the 11th century, the Kievan Rus became geographically the largest state in Europe and became known to the rest of Europe as Ruthenia. Yet, with such size, the nation succumbed to great instability as it tried to keep itself together. Civil war engulfed Ruthenia as several principalities revolted in an effort to expand their domain. And as chaos soared across Ukraine, suddenly the Mongols rode across the nation, ransacking the already weakened state. With poor team coordination and even poor security measures, it is no wonder the Kievan Rus got obliterated. And so you don't end up like them is why you should use NordPass business, baby! With the world becoming ever so more digitized, cybersecurity becomes ever so more important. And that's where NordPass business comes to help. By using NordPass, you can rest assured that your data and personal information stay safe. With the NordPass Business Password Manager, you will save time and energy, as NordPass eases the access to business accounts, making it possible for your team to work across devices and apps uninterrupted. Log into your accounts in seconds, securely share sensitive data with your colleagues, and make payments efficiently backed by the highest standard of cybersecure technology. NordPass also helps you store and access your online accounts from anywhere. No more storing hundreds of passwords in your notebooks. Nord encrypts them, and with a click of a button, you get them instantly. Alongside this, NordPass also stores and encrypts your credit card data, and with a click of a button, you can make payments and purchases without a delay, while also resting assured that your data stays safe. Same applies for any sensitive information such as credentials, alarm codes, or pins. With NordPass, your confidential information can be saved securely in one place and accessed and updated by others you give permission to when needed. NordPass also proactively scans the web for any data breaches regarding your account and notifies you in real time. So go and click the link in the description by going to nordpass.com slash livingironically and get your 3 month free trial with code livingironically to protect yourself. None of the princedoms stood a chance and by the mid 13th century all the previously warring states acknowledged the Mongols as their overlords. However, throughout the 14th century the Poles and Lithuanians were able to liberate most of Ukrainian territory from the Mongols and decide to rule it for themselves, with both Poland and Lithuania formally declaring their rulers as also being the rulers of the Rus. From then on, different parts of Ukraine were ruled by Poland, Lithuania and Russia respectively. During this time, like literally everywhere else in the world, the peasants were treated worse than a Bangladeshi in Qatar, which prompted them to discover the wonders of feudalism. Unsurprisingly, the peasants, who tended to be Ukrainian and Orthodox, rebelled against being treated like livestock, whose only purpose was to enrich their wealthy owners, who were usually Polish and Catholic or Jewish. Cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. Due to increasing religious conflict, in the late 1500s, the Ruthenian Church signed an act of union with Rome, where they recognized the papacy but keep their own Eastern rites and the Slavonic Church language. During this time, in Ukraine's southern steppe frontier, many serfs decided to abandon their homes and create their own societies called the Cossacks. While nowadays they're known as these spastic jumpers with massive mustaches, back then the Cossacks were nomadic warriors for hire who, in the 17th century, formed their own state, calling it the Cossack Hetmanate. This is widely considered the first emergence of the Ukrainian state, and it had the joy of being surrounded by enemies on all three sides, with the Turks in the south, the Commonwealth of Poland Lithuania to the west, and Russia in the east. The Cossacks decide to enter into a treaty of protection with Russia, and a short time later, Poland and Russia divided up Ukraine territory between the two. However, as we know from today, Russia's loving protection gradually descended into absolutist rule, and more or less completely subjugated the Cossacks. 
After Poland was partitioned in the late 18th century, some of western Ukraine came under Austrian dominion, while the rest was made part of the Russian Empire. Under the Russian Empire, the Ukrainian language was banned, even in schools. And over the next several decades, intense programs of mass Russification ensued, as many Russian settlers also started settling in the region. While at the time Russia referred to the Rutinians as Little Russians, by the beginning of the 19th century, a concrete Ukrainian identity was beginning to take hold, with numerous works of literature and political thought being produced and distributed underground. By 1848, the Ukrainian flag as we know it was designed. After the February Revolution in Russia of 1917 and all the changes that that brought about, different nationalities in what made up Russia at the time started to get very nervous and petitioned the government for autonomy and Ukraine declared straight up independence. Would you like to sign my petition? Later the same year, the Bolsheviks invaded Ukraine. Between 1917 and 1919 was a particularly fun time to declare independence. With the Maknovishina, the Ukrainian People's Republic, the Ukrainian state, the West Ukrainian People's Republic all declaring independence and then shortly after being deleted. During the anarchy, the Germans, Austrians, Bolsheviks, Whites, Polish army and the anarchists all fought for control, which turned Ukraine into a dumpster fire, the likes of which were only ever seen in the Balkans. After the end of World War I, Ukraine was partitioned yet again between Poland and Russia and in 1922 it became one of the founding members of the Soviet Union and then began the wonderful process of agricultural and industrial collectivization. For whatever reason, when you force peasants to do backbreaking labor for nothing in return, productivity goes down. I know, it sounds wild. Yet, in 1932, the Soviet authorities increased Ukraine's production quotas to such a level that they would be impossible to meet. That combined with poor weather leading to poor harvest and the Soviet Union exporting the already meager harvest to the rest of the republics and abroad in an effort to preserve face, led to starvation on mass scale. And while we still don't know how many Ukrainians died, conservative estimates begin at 4 million. This event became known as the Holodomor, and one of the most horrific events in Ukrainian history, and one of the many grievances in the Russo-Ukrainian relations today. During Germany's autistic spur in the 40s, Ukraine became one of the most important battlegrounds. Initially, the Ukrainians hoped that the Germans being the enemy of both Poland and Russia could be an ally in finally delivering their dream of independence and having actual lunch for once instead of pebbles Babushka Svetlana picked up from the yard. Instead, the Germans gave Galicia to Poland and Bukovina to Romania, and the remainder became the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. 1.5 million Jews were exterminated and the Nazis showed their famous love for Slavs by taking 2.2 million Ukrainians to Germany to use as slave labor. In 1943, the Soviet army was victorious in the Battle of Stalingrad and began their counteroffensive westwards. Ukraine being the second largest territory in the Soviet Union after Russia made up a large percentage of the Red Army, with 40% of it being ethnic Ukrainians. As the Germans retreated from Ukraine, they went totally scorched earth and raised as much of the land to the ground as they could. More than 700 cities and towns and 28,000 villages were destroyed and anywhere from 5 to 7 million people were lost. By the end of World War II, Ukraine was thoroughly destroyed. The entire country needed immediate economic reconstruction and a mass rebuiltment effort took place. Soon after the Soviet authorities jumped on to reinstate their total control over the territory. While Ukrainian writers, artists and poets were encouraged to encourage the Ukrainian identity to mobilize efforts against the Germans, Sovietification became the new cool thing and intense programs of Sovietification spread across Ukraine, which the Ukrainians enjoyed about as much as a root canal. Once Khrushchev took power, the Soviets' hardline stance against Ukrainians relaxed. In Khrushchev eyes, Ukrainians who adhered to the party line and served the state with loyalty were trustworthy and promoted to high-level positions in government. In 1954, the Soviet Union celebrated the 300th anniversary of the, as they called it, reunification of Ukraine with Russia and the Crimean Peninsula was awarded to Ukraine. However, during this time, there were still over a half a million Ukrainian dissidents scattered in gulags around the Soviet Union. But hey, that's alright. In the 70s and 80s, Ukraine's economy took a nosedive and in 1986, it had the worst nuclear accident in history at Chernobyl. Dozens of people died in an immediate term and tens of thousands had to be evacuated. 5 million people were exposed to elevated radiation levels, 
with hundreds of thousands exposed to levels high enough to increase their risks of developing various cancers. With the decline of the USSR, action needed to be taken to make the nation once more competitive. Thus, in 1986, Gorbachev began his campaign of perestroika and glasnost, which meant more involvement of non-Russians in the political process and the restructuring of both the political and economic system. While it wasn't intended to, there were marked upticks in nationalism of the republics, and yet again the Ukrainian identity took hold in the popular imagination. Soon after, in 1989, a law was passed that for the first time in history designated Ukrainian as the country's official language. Not long after, the Ukrainian parliament declared independence after a referendum where 90% chose independence, with every single part of the country voting in favor of it, and that's also including Crimea. Quite soon after, the Soviet Union formally dissolved and the state building process began and more pro-Western foreign policy was quickly instituted but frequently found its progress slow and frustrating. All the post-communist governments transitioning to open market economies experienced a sort of shock therapy and Ukraine was no different. As a result, its economy stagnated, foreign investment stayed low and corruption continued to be a particularly stubborn problem. The 90s and 2000s continued with Ukraine often being used as an intermediary between Europe and Russia, with each one's influence in the country constantly waxing and waning. Of note was the Orange Revolution in 2004, which was triggered by the public, fed up with corruption and wanting a more westernly relationship. Taken to the streets in massive protests after the Russian-backed candidate won in a very suspicious manner and getting a new election in which Yushchenko won. In November 2013, Ukraine was due to sign a special association agreement to bring it closer to the EU. Instead, President Yanukovych decided to pursue closer ties with Russia and refused to sign it, leading it again to absolutely massive street protests being centered in Maidan, aka Independent Square, which turned into the Europe Maidan protests, the result of which led to the then president to flee to Russia. In February 2014, there came the crisis in Crimea, where Russia forcibly annexed the Ukrainian territory and stirred up violent unrest in eastern Ukraine in the Donbass. In addition to that, in February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine and caused the largest refugee crisis since World War II, with the brilliant idea that they could just take the country in three days and install a new Russian-friendly regime, which has just worked wonders for them. <laughs> Instead, Ukraine has held off the invasion and as of this video the war has still been going on. Despite its current rough situation, Ukraine is a country with a rich history and even richer culture. Its story has been characterized with a fight for survival and preservation of its identity. It's not been an easy battle, yet the people in our country have persisted. From the Kievan Rus to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, all the way to the USSR and modern-day Ukraine. The Ukrainian people were able to preserve and push through, and hopefully in time they'll be able to go through the current hardships as well. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did consider becoming a member like these lovely people, and also go and check out theironicshop.com and get yourself some merch to support the channel for more videos like this. And once more, thank you to NordPass for supporting the channel. Go and click the link in the description to get your 3 month free trial with code LIVINGIRONICALLY to protect your virtual data. By supporting my sponsor you support me as well. My name is Janos and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe. Hey, hey, why are you leaving?